Hey, Jeremy. Why, look, why are you looking so blue? Diabetes is just kicking my butt today, man. I'm high. I'm low. My time and range is like 2%. I've just had it with diabetes, man. I'm sorry, buddy. I, I've been there. But you know what I try to remind myself of? What's that? That there's never been a better time to have diabetes. Type 1 and type 2. What, what do you mean? Oh, man. In the last 10 years, look at the advances. Continuous glucose monitors, hybrid closed loop, better insulins for people with type 2, oral medications, and others that help protect their heart as well as improve their diabetes. You know what? People 50, 60 years ago, they couldn't have even dreamed of having these things. Hey there, Mac. Yeah, you. You have a touch of the sugars? Why, of course you do. Well, why not do something about it, pal? What's new with glucose monitoring, you ask? Why, everything, of course. Cheer up there, mopey man. Gone are the days of just wondering what your sugar level is. That's right, pal. We now have urine testing. The splashing means it's working. <laughs> Out of sight. And who knows what the future will hold? Testing your blood sugar? You heard me right, it's just around the corner. Getting a blood sample is easy as pie. With just under one pint of blood, you can get a result by this time tomorrow morning. Science. Still not convinced? How about a continuous glucose monitor? We're telling you folks, this is the absolute latest and greatest in diabetes technology. And her name is Myrtle. Check your blood sugar. Day or night, Myrtle will help you monitor your blood sugar every five minutes. Check your blood sugar. Check your blood sugar. Check your blood sugar. <laughs> Godspeed, Myrtle. What about new medications? That's right, folks. We've got both of them. The pill and the shot. <laughs> Looks like you've met your match, diabetes. Those insulin injections got you down? Well, check out the latest in insulin pumps. Cannonball! Better start eating, mister. That was 500 units of pure bovine insulin. Fantastic. And last but not least, we have the latest advance in diabetes tonic. That's right, patriots. It's Dr. Edelman's famous diabetes tonic. Guaranteed to put hair on your head, some pep in your step, and diabetes on the run. And don't forget, folks, Dr. Edelman's tonic is used by most leading psychologists to treat the blood sugar blues. Uh, hey there, Bill. You know that's just bourbon, right? Act now before Bill drinks it all. Wow. Thanks for that perspective, Steve. That was amazing. Us, you know, us type 1s really have come a long way. And now that I think about it, it's really inspired me to do a lecture on it. Like, right now. Like, like right now. Okay, so obviously I was super inspired by all that old-timey diabetes stuff to do a talk about how good it is to have type 1 diabetes right now. And I'm telling you, when I was preparing this talk and learning about the history of diabetes and specifically the history of insulin, it really was inspiring to me. So I'm going to take this on a little bit of a journey um, back in time about what living with diabetes used to be like all the way up to today to hopefully have us gain some perspective. And I love this picture because there's this guy on one side that says there's three things and on the other side it says four. Take a second to look at that. It's trippy. I still can't quite figure it out. Um, but it's all about keeping it in perspective. So I mentioned a little bit in the very, very intro talk my story, but now it's my platform and Steve's not here. So I can elaborate a little bit more without him kind of butting in. So this is me, 1994, when I was diagnosed. I was 15 years old when I got type 1 diabetes. In this picture, I'm probably eight, but I was a really awkward teenager, and it's my talk, so I get to put in whatever cute picture I want with my little teddy bears here. 
So I was 15 and all the classic stuff started happening. I was, you know, drinking all the time. I was waking up multiple times during, out, during the night to, to pee. I lost like 15 pounds I didn't have to lose. I was already a skinny teenager. Um, I remember jumping into the pool and the shallow end and, and scraping the bottom and hitting my chin. And this scar on my chin just didn't heal for like months. So I had all the classic signs. And, you know, I'm drinking, I'm peeing all the time. And basically what happened is um, I was um, telling my mom, you know, all these symptoms. And it was actually the day we went to move my brother into college. Um, we were moving him into Berkeley. I was 15. He was 18. It was a really hot day. And he was on, he was moving into the top floor of his dorms, the eighth floor, and the elevator had broken. So I'm walking up and down eight stories of, of stairs in like 100 degree weather, super thirsty. My parents are just giving me Pepsis and Cokes to drink all the time, the worst thing that they possibly could have done. I ended up throwing up on Telegraph Avenue for people that know Berkeley in a garbage can. I later ended up going to school there and walked past this garbage can all the time. Um, so anyways, I kind of pass out in the car, I get home, my parents say something's not right, take me to the, the urgent care, and they tested my blood sugar, and it ended up coming back high. And these meters, as you may or may not know, they typically read up to 600 or so. Um, so I was above 600. And they, they might have said I have diabetes. I honestly don't remember. But they did say, you're going to have to go to the hospital. But before you go to the hospital, you're going to be there for a few days. Go and get you know, a change of clothes, you know, your teddy bear, whatever you want, and then go to the hospital. But I didn't really want to go to the hospital. I uh, you know, said, Mom, I'm hungry. Can we go to Chili's? And she said, sure. So I remember I was sitting down, I had a full plate of baby back ribs, the little spicy apple sauce stuff that came with it. I was just putting back Dr. Peppers left and right. We're talking about school starting for me in a couple months. Finish up our meal, casually go to the hospital. And when I get there, they say, where have you been? We've been waiting for you. The doctor called ahead. They immediately ushered me to the intensive care unit because my blood sugar at that time was over a thousand. And everybody remembers this number like it's some kind of you know, competition you're trying to win. So I went from Chili's to the ICU in like five minutes. So that was quite a turnaround for me. And when I was in the ICU, I was there for maybe a day. They stabilized me, gave me IV, and IV insulin, and you know, I really didn't know what was going on. And pretty soon after that, they put me on kind of the regular wards where you know, the less sick people are. And here's me, just this cool, calm, collected guy. And this Gary Busey person over here was my roommate who also had type one diabetes. But this was like his fifth time being in the hospital. He was diagnosed like five, 10 years ago. And I remember thinking, I don't know what diabetes is at all, but I don't want to be this guy. I don't want to be back in the hospital. But it was a weird thing as a kid. You know, you think you get sick, you get better, and you move on with your life. So the concept of this is something you're going to be living with for the rest of your life, that was, that's, that's hard to, to deal with as a kid. I don't remember how I kind of processed that. So anyways, they gave me my first blood sugar meter, and I remember them being very excited about this. Like, we got these new cool meters, you know, like, you don't have to check your urine anymore. And I'm like, what do I care about what used to be? And so this was it. It was called the One Touch Basic. And I love that even then they knew it was basic. They're like, this is kind of crap. We're just going to call it basic, and maybe it'll get better. And it took about a minute to get a blood sugar result. And that thing on the front, you had to kind of take off and clean every once in a while, like an old school computer mouse. And it would take that 60 seconds, and a lot of times the result would come back would just say error, and you'd have to do it again, which was a pain, especially when you're a high school student trying to hide it under your desk or whatever and be like a normal kid. And this was my insulin regimen. You know, I had regular and NPH, and I took two shots. I mixed it together, took one in the morning, mixed it together, took one kind of in the evening. And even saying that out loud blows my mind, that I used to just, you know, ride out my NPH at lunch and not have to like bolus or anything like that. But... Obviously, these insulins are kind of archaic by today's standards, so, but this was my regimen, my old school meter, my old school insulins. And when I tell people this, when we, you know, used to kind of travel around for TCOID across the land, and I get two types of reactions when I tell people, you know, my initial regimen, what I was diagnosed with. And, you know, the kind of the newbies, people that are recently diagnosed, 5, 10, 15 years, poor Jeremy, regular NPH, I never even heard of that. You had it so rough no continuous glucose monitor, no pumps. Like, how did you do it? And I'm like, thanks guys, I appreciate that. And then there's the old timers that come in that have had diabetes 30, 40, 50 years. And they're like, are you kidding me? You have no idea how good you had it. At least you had like syringes. We had like bamboo or whatever we had to inject and checking our urine and we were boiling, boiling things for no reason. 
So it occurred to me when I get these different reactions that it's all about you know, where you come in with your diabetes story really kind of reflects your, your perspective. So it's important, like I started to want to learn from these old timers of what, what did it used to be like and why do I have it good, you know, now. So that made me kind of give, you know, it inspired me to look back on a little bit of the, the history of diabetes and give all of you some perspective that, you know, it might not help you when you want to throw your meter across the floor or your CGM or whatever in that moment, but it is useful to know kind of where we've come from and how quickly things are changing now in a positive way. Things are just rapidly changing that it's hard to keep up with sometimes. So let's go way back, way back when. So this is a picture and a, a pretty famous picture of a child before the discovery of insulin. And this is gonna have, this story is gonna have a, a good ending when I come back to it. But you can see this kid here, he's several years old, super skinny, kind of wasting away. And this was type one diabetes before insulin was discovered, which, you know, spoiler alert, was discovered in about 1921 or so. So it's been about 100 years, not that long ago. Yeah, 100 years, we can kind of, you know, get our minds around that. So this is a kid, you know, well, I should say that the diagnosis of type one diabetes universally fatal. Within six months or so, everybody diagnosed with type 1 diabetes would be dead. So that's a diagnosis that's worse than most metastatic cancers today. This was a severe, severe diagnosis. And keep in mind that these kids would be running around happy, healthy, and all of a sudden one day or one night they'd start peeing and drinking, you know, a little bit more, six months later, dead. You know, so this was, this was bad news and this was the state of the affairs in 1920s. You know, so when you see those swinging 1920s movies, remember, those people with diabetes were just, you know, passing away without insulin. It's crazy. All right, so when was diabetes first described? When did, when did diabetes come on the scene, if you will? And the first description of diabetes was actually from this guy named Aradius, or Aradius, I don't know how to pronounce that, who was this Greek philosopher. So this is, you know, way back. He actually was on a stamp that he was commem commemorated there. He had trimmed his beard a little bit for the stamp. I like that. And in second century AD, he has this quote. This is the first written description of diabetes, which I think is interesting. I'm gonna read it. So it says, diabetes is a wonderful affection, not very frequent among men, being a melting down of the flesh and limbs into urine. The patients never stop making water as if the opening of aqueducts. The melting is rapid, the death is speedy, life is disgusting and painful, thirst is unquenchable. They stand out for a certain time and then they pass urine with pain and emaciation is dreadful. So a couple things about this. this I, I think it's interesting that this idea was that people just basically pee themselves to death, that they can't keep like hold on to any nutrients, they're peeing all the time and they melt. They just dissolve away into their urine. And he describes in no you know, minor details that this was a painful, disgusting death. This was not something you wanted to get. Um, so it was described here, second century AD. So diabetes is on the scene. So when's the advances? What comes next in terms of diabetes? Figuring out what it is, what causes it, how we treat it, all those kinds of things. Second century AD, time passes and passes. Then really the next entry in the diabetes playbook is until the 1600s. So we got like a thousand years or so that have now pa passed. We got this dude, Thomas Willis. He publishes a book. I love this. He publishes a medical journal book called The Diabetes or Pissing Evil. So apparently the word piss back then was like a medical term that you could just like put on the cover of your book in 1674. And he says, those with the disease piss a great deal more than they drink and the urine was wonderfully sweet as if imbued with sugar. So you might be wondering, well, so first this guy, he actually got it right that there's, that the people are peeing a lot more, but it's a sweet urine. So there's something going on with sugar, which is a critical breakthrough, but you got to be wondering, how did he know that the urine was sweet? And back then, they used to taste the urine. This was part of like the medical playbook. You would taste the urine and you'd be like, oh, you got a little gout, or like maybe you're a little bit anemic. They would diagnose all kinds of crap. But when it came to diabetes, it, they actually got it right. This was one thing that actually tasting the urine kind of paid off for because it tasted sweet. So they knew that there was sugar in the urine. So there's something going on that these people aren't processing sugar the way that they should. Now, all right, they know that sugar is, 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 is is critical to metabolism, but they don't know what's controlling it. The word insulin is not even anywhere near being discovered yet. And they just start with, well, what organ? What organ is, is controlling diabetes, is controlling sugar? And there was a lot of different theories on this. People thought it was the brain, the liver, the kidneys, all these kind of important organs. Because when it came to the pancreas, everybody thought it was kind of like a BS organ, to be honest. 
Like people would be in, in car accidents, I guess it wasn't car accidents, they would be in like, you know, horse and trolley accidents and lose half their pancreas and they would be completely fine. So people are like, well, the pancreas doesn't really do much. And 99% of the pancreas is responsible for just digesting fat and protein and things like that. And less than 1% of the pancreas has these little islets in it called the islets of Langerhans. And within those islets are the beta cells that make insulin. So it really was like this needle in a haystack, the diamond in the rough, these tiny little cells in this kind of seemingly worthless organ that was responsible for diabetes. So people just weren't thinking about the pancreas when it came to something that if you lost the function of this, the, this organ, that you'd be dead in six months. Because again, the pancreas just wasn't that. Everybody knew the liver was where it was at, but they didn't really know the pancreas uh, was that important. So this guy Langerhans, he actually discovers these islets, and islets means islands. These little islands within the pancreas that are doing something. And when he discovered it in 1869, obviously he got his name associated with it, islets of Langerhans, but he said, I have no idea what they do. I just looked in a microscope, I found them, you know, give me cred, and that was about it. And I have this picture of this guy, Neil in the haystack, because that's really what it was, that finding that this was linked to diabetes was a hard, a hard jump to make. But a couple decades later, these guys come around, and they're the ones that figure out the pancreas is, is, is the organ responsible for diabetes. And what they did is they actually removed the pancreas of dogs. And they had this one dog that they tell the story. It was a dog that it was, it was kind of like the laboratory dog. You know, he would go out to pee every time he needed to. He'd scratch on the door. He was a good dog. They take out this dog's pancreas. The next day they come back into the lab and they notice that this dog had peed all over the place. He, you know, in the lab, like whatever, and the, the, the urine also was attracting ants. It seemed like it was really sweet, things like that. So they finally realized that the pancreas was something that was actually critical to diabetes. So that was a big leap forward. All right. So meanwhile, people are being diagnosed with diabetes left and right. You know, people are dying. So what was the treatment? If you were in the 1800s, or early 1900s, and you came to your doctor and said, my kid just, you know, he's peeing all the time. He has diabetes. What's the treatment? And the treatment, you know, some of the treatments were just complete, were completely bogus. These are actual ads for things for diabetes back then. Dill's diabetic mixture, mixture, it positively cures diabetes. His thirst is allayed almost instantly. His strength reappears. All his functions are gradually restored. And in 1894, there was 42 of these listed diabetic remedies, included bromides, ethanol, cocaine, opium, uranium, arsenic. So, you know, would these do anything for your diabetes? No but maybe you get a little cocaine or opium going, maybe you'd feel a little bit better, you know, why not? But they would prey on people that, you know, there's nothing else to take. You know, so people, these, this is like these snake oil charms salesmen that would sell us stuff that was completely bogus. So here's an actual ad, and what I like about this is that, you know, you, can, you can't really make out the top, but at the very bottom in red, it says successful results depend on regular and persistent, persistent dosage. So it's just garbage, but make sure you keep buying it and keep taking it if you want to have an effect. So this was one of the treatments that people would actually use. And again, not that long ago. This guy, I like him, he's a French you know, physiologist that said, okay, well, the, the, the body can't hold on to sugar for some reason. It's peeing out sugar all the time. So maybe for treatment, we should have people just eat a ton of sugar and then they can kind of keep up. You know, it's, it's not a bad idea when you think about it, but it actually is the worst thing that you can do. And this guy actually later in his life himself got diabetes, followed his own advice, ate a bunch of, you know, I don't think they had any of these things back then, but he ate a bunch of sugar, syrup, whatever, and he ended up dying from diabetes and its complications because he did the wrong treatment. All right, so what worked? If you wanted something that actually worked for type 1 diabetes before insulin, it really, it was sad, it was starvation. And what they would do is they would have these, these hospital wards that were just full of kids with type 1 diabetes that they would admit them to the wards and basically not feed them because they would find out that if you just gave them a very low amount of calories, they could you know, kind of survive but not go into diabetic ketoacidosis. So it was this fine line between starving people to death or having them you know, overwhelm them and having them go into DKA. So this was the treatment that could you know, keep people alive for several years, but it wasn't a good one. So this is one of the, the, the kids, you know, that was admitted to these wards. You can imagine admitting your son or daughter to the, to the unit, and this is what they look like. And the doctor is like, well, I think to treat your son, we're going to have to give him 300 calories a day. I mean, it just blows my mind. So, and it says, comparative observations of patients dying from starvation 
or by violations of their diet, have convinced us that suffering is distinctly less under the former program. Meaning, should we have kids die from starvation or from DKA? Seems like starvation is the more kind of ethical way to go, so we'll just really, you know, limit people's calories. And, and that's saying something, that if starvation was better than just, you know, feeding yourself and going to DKA, things are grim. Um, so, this is my story for kind of what rock bottom looks like. And then, trust me, things are going to get a little bit better. So this was one of these wards and they had this 12 year old blind diabetic boy who had persistent levels of sugar in his urine. And I have to explain, you know, a little bit more what they would do. So they would take people with type 1 diabetes, admit them to, you know, the wards and then completely starve them, not feed them at all, until they had no sugar in their urine. And then they would gradually start feeding them a little bit of calories to see when they might start spilling sugar into their urine again. And let's say that was 300 calories, they would know that was that, what that person could kind of handle for the day. So for this kid, they admitted him, completely starved him, but every day he kept having sugar in his urine, so they're like, what is going on? How is he getting food? What's, what's happening that's making him pee into, you know, sugar into his urine? And they wondered. This is what they found out. This is this guy, Frederick Allen, who was kind of a famous diabetologist at that time, and said, um, it turned, this is also, I said, a blind kid. So, and because he was blind, he was allowed to have a bird in his, in his uh, room as like kind of a pet. And it said, it turned out that his supposed helplessness was the very thing that gave him opportunities which other persons lacked. So among, because he was blind, he got this bird. It said, among unusual eaten things were toothpaste and bird seed, the latter being from the cage of a canary, which he asked for. It says, these facts were obtained by confession after long and plausible denials. This experience illustrates with what great care is necessary if records of diabetic patients are to be vouched for as correct. So talk about rock bottom. This poor blind kid is being starved. He's already starving. He's getting out of his bed at night to eat bird seed because he wants something. And meanwhile, his endocrinologist is yelling at him because he's not telling the truth. So if you think your endo is mean to you about, you know, why are you high here? Why are you high there? This is intense. And so this is just so sad that this was, you know, kind of the state of affairs. All right. Things are going to kind of get positive here now, so let me see how I'm doing. All right, so the story of insulin. Here comes our savior, right? You know, to be honest, I'm not a, a reader. I read enough like medical stuff. I don't have a lot of time for kind of casual reading, but I have read this book. I highly recommend it to everybody with diabetes or without diabetes because it's all about the discovery of insulin. It reads like a soap opera with you know, these interesting characters and the drama about insulin. So I really recommend it. You can read it in a day, no problem. Um, great book. All right, so what is the story of insulin? How did we get insulin? Um, and what did it do for people? So to talk about insulin, which again, is still heralded as one of the greatest discoveries of, in medicine, period. And it started with this guy, Frederick Banting. And he actually was an orthopedic surgeon, believe it or not. This guy is replacing knees and hips. It is a, a constant source of embarrassment for endocrinologists that insulin was discovered by an orthopedic surgeon who, by the way, orthopedic surgeons are the ones that we always kind of dump on for being dumb. Um, you know, fun love. But um, an orthopedic surgeon is the one that discovered insulin. So this is this guy. He's, um, you know, working away. He's going to discover insulin eventually. But he starts off as this orthopedic surgeon with no particular talent, so to speak of. I love this quote from his high school principal. It says, we would not have picked him for one of whom fame would settle. It's like, geez, you know, thanks, like, principal. Like, they obviously interviewed them after he discovered insulin, and they're still like, this guy sucked. Um, so he's working in a clinic, and this is a time of, like, prohibition. He's actually in, um, in Canada, and people are coming in to get prescriptions for alcohol all the time because they need it for pain or whatever they use it for back then. And he has this quote, I gave him a prescription for alcohol, but considered myself rather highly trained for the bartending business. So this is his state of affairs. He's just seeing patients in this clinic, giving them alcohol. He thinks he's kind of meant for bigger things. So you can see kind of the story building. All right. So one night he goes to bed and he has this idea. He's thinking about diabetes because this is kind of something like a problem that's out there in the literature now about we're right on the cusp of, of discovering, you know, this, this hormone, you know, the, the idea of a hormone had just been discovered. This, this secretion, what, what it is that's controlling diabetes. And Bante has this idea. So he goes to bed one night and he has this idea. And he runs to his medical journal at 2 a.m. and he actually writes this down, his idea that he has. And I'll explain this. But he says, diabetes, I'm going to ligate the ducts of dogs. So he's going to take dogs, cut all their ducts to their pancreas. He's going to keep the dogs alive until the islets, or well, sorry, 
actually the, like the external part of the pancreas kind of disintegrates, leaving the islet. So he wants to kind of kill everything around the, the pancreas except leaving the islets. And he's going to take those and isolate the internal secretion. That's what they called insulin. They didn't know what it was. It was just a secretion. And I'm going to relieve glycosuria, which is basically sugar in the urine. So basically what he's saying is like, I'm going to find insulin and this is how I'm going to do it. And I love this because he wrote this down and this is in his journal. First of all, he spelled diabetes wrong. This isn't a weird, you know, English spelling of this. He just didn't really, wasn't really familiar with it. So the guy that discovered insulin starts off by not even knowing how to spell diabetes. He also spelled glycosuria wrong, but we're going to give him credit for that because who knows how to spell that. And it actually was written at 2 a.m. And this is in his journal, October 31st, no less. So on Halloween, stuff gets weird. Um, and he writes this down in his journal. And you can actually see this on display in a, in a, in a museum. So here's his idea. Take these dogs, cut the ducts to the pancreas, wait about six weeks, the pancreas gets kind of destroyed. I'm going to take the pancreas out, do something to it, don't know what, purify insulin, become famous, and then inject insulin back into these dogs to kind of keep them alive. And that's his rudimentary idea. But keep in mind now, he's not, he doesn't have a lab, he doesn't have dogs, he's, he's not in this trade. So he, he goes to Toronto, to this guy, Dr. McLeod, who's a well-known physiologist, and he pitches this concept. He says, this is what I want to do. McLeod says, well, maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. I don't know. I'm going on sabbatical to like Europe or something like that. Why don't you tinker around in my lab while I'm gone? When I come back, we can see if you had any you know, results or whatever. And so McLeod says, and when I leave, I'm going to give you a medical student to work with. And he gives him Charlie Best. And it was Banting and Best. Those are the two famous names that go on to kind of get credit for discovering insulin. And the funny little story about Best is that it was actually between him and one other medical student who would work with Banting and Best lost a coin toss. So he was forced to work with this crazy orthopedic surgeon with this crazy idea for the summer, give up his summer in medical school, which he, didn't, he wasn't super stoked about. But he ends up, again, spoiler alert, winning a Nobel Prize for this, you know, working with this kind of kooky, kooky guy. So this is the team, Banting and Best. They got a lab. They got a rudimentary idea to kind of start playing with. And they go to work. And the first thing they need is dogs. And they need to take out the pancreas of a dog. And that's not an easy surgery to do. The pancreas is very gelatinous. Um, it's, it's hard to, to, to deal with. It's, it's not an easy surgery for even surgeons today to kind of do. So somebody who's never done it before, certainly on a dog, it's tough. And they needed dogs. So it said we would buy dogs on the street for one to three dollars each. I recall Fred even leading one dog back to the lab by his necktie. And I love this image. They need dogs. They're like going out at night and wrangling dogs, you know, back to their lab. And, you know, these poor dogs, they, you know, try to keep them alive. But this was science back then. That's kind of how it worked. And because they didn't really know what they were doing, this is some of their, their early entries into their journal. And you, can, you can't make out a lot of the words. You can see some of the dates. But what you can clearly see is that these dogs were dying. You know, that they were trying the surgery. Um, it wouldn't go well. They would die from infections or from diabetes or whatever. And so things weren't going well initially. But finally, they start getting some positive data. They're able to take some of this internal secretion. Maybe something's working. And they have to present some of their, their initial findings at this big medical meeting in Yale, December 30th, 1921. And Banting goes to present it with McLeod. McLeod's now back from sabbatical. He sees that Banting is maybe onto something and starts to kind of, kind of move in on his ideas. And at this uh, meeting, this is Elliot Joslin who said this, who's another famous diabetes name. He said, Banting spoke haltingly, meaning kind of like nervously and stuff like that, McLeod beautifully. And McLeod started to get kind of all the credit for what Banting was doing, which didn't really sit well with him. So Banting, um, he, he's kind of a, a hot-headed guy. And he starts drinking. He's really upset. He's talking to his buddy, Charlie Best. And, you know, so Charlie Best comes into the lab one day, sees Banting passed out from drinking all night because he's so upset that McLeod's taking his ideas. He splashes water on his face. He slaps him around in this very, like, Hollywood moment. And he says, wake up. And Banting says, all right, we're going to do it. We're going to get insulin. We're going to figure this out. And he says, this is the last drink I will ever take until insulin circulates in diabetic veins. I mean, give me a break. Who talks like that now? And it says, shake on it, Charlie. We start in the morning at 9 o'clock where we left off. I mean, that's just written for a movie. Not that, that moment doesn't happen ever. So he's like, yeah, drunk, slaps in some sense into him. And they get back to work. And they start having some success again. This is Marjorie, one of the first dogs that they're actually able to take the pancreas out, you know, inject insulin back into the dog, keep it alive for a long time. So they're really starting to figure out that they can actually treat diabetes, which is incredible. So they have some success. 
Now, they need to take this initial kind of crude fluid that they're giving and purify it. And again, they don't have any experience in this area, so they, they call in this guy, this chemist, this guy, Dr. Collip, who's really coming in at the one yard line to take this thing across the finish line or across the touchdown, to stay with my metaphor. And this is what happens. So he's in the lab trying to purify insulin. And this is another made for TV movie moment where he says, I experienced then and there all alone in the top story of the old pathology building, the greatest thrill which has ever been given to me to realize I saw insulin. So again, this guy's in there, he's got microscopes, pipettes, he figures it out. He's alone in this lab in Toronto. He, he's discovered insulin, something that's gonna save the lives of hundreds of millions of people over time, and he's done it. And he has this moment where he can kind of decide, do I go the good route and share everything you know, with my colleagues, Banting and Best, tell them how I did this, or do I be kind of a jerk and keep it to myself and run with it? And unfortunately, Evil Homer wins out. He goes to, to Banting and Best and says, you know what, I discovered insulin, but I'm not gonna tell you how I did it. I'm like, I'm super cool. And that doesn't go well with Banting. And again, he's an orthopedic surgeon. He's kind of a bigger guy. He's a hothead. He's clearly an alcoholic. And this is what happened. He said, he made his to go. Collip was like, they were having this altercation. Collip was getting up to go. I grabbed him with one hand by his overcoat, sat him down the chair. I remember telling him it was a good job. He was so much smaller. Otherwise I would knock the hell out of him. He told us he had talked it over with McLeod and they agreed not to tell us by which means they purified the extract. So I can't blame Banting for being mad. This is an actual cartoon of the time of the discovery of insulin. It's pretty accurate. This is kind of how it went down in this like laboratory pseudo brawl. But they you know, kind of came to terms with it, settled things initially. This is the first patient to ever get insulin. And they basically purified this in the lab in Toronto, ran it across the street, literally, um, to inject one of these patients that was uh, admitted to the hospital. This is Leonard Thompson. Um, and it was described as a thick brown muck. So everybody that takes insulin knows that insulin is clear. It's got a very distinct smell. It's not thick, it's not brown. So this was not quite the purified stuff we have today. Uh, January 11th, 1922, first insulin injection. Again, not that long ago. Um, so this was uh, the, the patient's urine, or a patient's urine sugar log. And the higher the little graph is, the more sugar they have in their urine. And these little kind of like marks on the top is when they were getting this insulin injections. And you can see with the more frequent insulin injections that the sugar in the urine actually disappeared. So this was actually working. First, documented evidence of insulin helping with diabetes. All right, Leonard Thompson got his injection. Um, it worked. Other people started getting this, this thick brown muck and eventually they were able to you know, purify it more into insulin. Um, they actually sold the patent to Eli Lilly for $1, if you can believe it, um, because they wanted to get this out to the masses. And obviously insulin still has its issues with um, you know, the cost of insulin and things like that. But it was sold for a dollar. And this is what happened when they started giving this injection to people with diabetes. There's these fantastic stories about literally going room to room to people almost comatose, kids dying from diabetes, injecting them with insulin, and the next you know, few hours they're waking up, um, they're coming back to life. It was just these incredible stories. So this was this horrible picture I showed you at the beginning. This kid clinging to his mother, can't walk, dying, clearly suffering in pain. This was the same child several months later you know, given insulin. And these were the pictures that started getting into magazines and newspapers. And you don't have to be any kind of medical professional to realize that whatever you're doing here is making a huge difference. This kid all of a sudden looks like a kid. You know, he's got color, he's got, you know, fullness in his cheeks. He's sitting there by himself, like, I don't need anybody's help. So this was amazing to kind of see this. There's all kinds of pictures of people being transformed. So clearly, this was a major discovery. This is another one, the same kid that I showed you admitting for starvation, injecting them, and you just see people come back to life. So yes, I complain all the time about how long it takes my insulin to kick in and I got the highs and lows. We all do that. But just to imagine living in a world that wasn't that long ago where it just wasn't even available it is crazy. And you hear stories about people camping out in front of you know, the, the lab and tents and things like that. Just an outcry for people to get this. So to kind of round out this story, McLeod and Banting, who hated each other at this time, were actually dual awarded the Nobel Prize. And they said, well, this guy, the other guy didn't do anything. And they actually shared it with their counterparts. So Banting shared it with Charlie Best. McLeod shared it with Collip, the chemist. And they never really kind of reconciled this. They never really became friends. But the history books really kind of show that Banting and Best were ones that did the work. 
Um, and, and they're the ones that we really kind of think about. There's these you know, famous banting lectures and things that we have in, in diabetes. So it's a, it's a figure that we you know, somewhat revere. All right, fast forward 70 years later. So insulin has obviously been discovered and we're back to adorable old 15 slash eight year old Jeremy. And there's all this history behind me that I had no idea about. So I get my regular, I get my MPH, I get my meter, and I'm kind of like, woe is me. And appropriately so, no 15-year-old should have to go through this. But to, to just kind of take a second and realize how much we've had to go through to even get to this point, which by today's standards still sucks, and where we've come from even the 90s is really incredible. So insulin, the gift that keeps giving. We have all kinds of lectures at TCOID um, that you can find on our website about um, you know, the new insulins. This is a little bit messed up on top. Two new basal insulins called Tujeo and Traceba. These, if you're on shots, these are better insulins than Lantus or Levomir. They last longer, they have less low blood sugars, they're more consistent. So if you're on shots, definitely looking into one of those. We have more rapid acting insulins. I have a talk that you can find on demand on um, inhaled insulin, which is a Frezza, that works within you know, minutes. It peaks within 30, 40 minutes or so. So we, we keep modifying insulin to make it fit our needs. And we can make it last longer, we can make it more rapid acting. And I should say that Lumjev just came out several months ago. Trasheb and Tujevo a few years ago. Fias a couple years ago. These are things that are happening right now that we're building on this story of insulin. Now what about pumps? I love this pump, I, I, this picture. I need more backstory on this picture because this was the first pump. It was just this giant typewriter this guy has on his back with wires going to his wrist for some reason. Um, this was it. So obviously not, you know, user friendly. This was a, the most kind of, or the first kind of uh, commercially available pump, pump called the auto syringe, which is basically just a device that just kind of slowly pushed in the syringe. It was about this size. So imagine, you know, a five-year-old wearing on this on their belt or whatever. It's just not practical. First blood sugar meter. I like this one. So this was like in the 70s and they actually marketed this to emergency rooms to quickly tell if somebody was low with a low blood sugar or drunk because that was hard to tell. Sometimes people would come in, you know, acting like whatever, and they wanted to know, is this person intoxicated? What's their blood sugar? This is called the Ames Reflectance Meter. It was about $500 in the 70s, so probably a couple grand now. And you had to plug it into a wall, you had to put a huge drop of blood on it, and it, you got this kind of bathroom scale kind of readout. And I love this quote from a diabetologist who started using one of these in the early days. And he says, one day I arrived for a meeting, I was carrying my meter in a bag, and I hung it up in the coat room. A few minutes later, everyone was in panic, saying a bomb had been found in the coat room. The entire 24-story building was evacuated. It took me some time to convince the bomb squad not to blow up my meter. So I like that quote because, you know, it just shows how far we've come. You take out a meter now, everybody knows what it is. Um, they might be a little bit curious about it, but certainly they're not going to think it's a bomb. So just in the 70s, you know, having a blood sugar meter was just like, what in the hell is that? So we've come a long way in those regards. I actually got my hands on one of these literally in Hawaii. That's why I'm dressed like this couple years ago, so I had to take a picture of it, just enjoying it. All right, so what about my story? So here's my first meter in 1994, One Touch Basic. A couple years later, I got the One Touch 2. It has a memory function now, so I can scroll through it and write it in my logbook, and my endocrinologist doesn't get mad at me. Ten years goes by, we got a new meter, we're smaller, five seconds. That's, that's nice, it's an intervention or a breakthrough, I guess, but it took a decade to get there. And then in 2010, I got my first continuous glucose monitor, and since then, it's really been off to the races. Where it's like an iPhone. Every year, I think there's a new one that does a little bit better. You know, instead of the camera being better, it's a little more accurate. You know, it's it's easier to wear things like that. So you know, the, the Dexcom four or five, um, the Medtronic sensors, they're all kind of coming up. And in 2018, a big breakthrough where I can now wear a continuous glucose monitor. I don't have to check my blood sugar at all. I haven't pricked my finger in months, if not a year. I can see my blood sugars on my watch right now, and if it was good, I would show it to you, but it's not so great, so it's none of your business. Um, and you know, I can share it with people. Um, friends, family can see what my blood sugars are if they're in New York, Japan, you know, whatever. This is a huge breakthrough. Um, I'm on a pump now that starts automating insulin delivery, Tandem Control IQ. If I'm high, it starts giving me more insulin. If I start going low, a little bit less. We have kind of lectures on these things. Um, so we're starting to automate insulin delivery without me doing anything based on my continuous glucose monitor. I mean, this is a huge breakthrough. The whole point is better blood sugar control with less work. So again, think about not that long ago, people just not having insulin at all. 
And now we have all these sophisticated tools of, of measuring blood sugars, of responding. Um, and in a couple years, like two, three years, we're gonna have fully automated insulin delivery systems where we don't really have to think about it much at all. So this isn't 15, 20 years down the, down the way. This is on the, uh, very much on the horizon. You know, just showing this, that basically on the top, you can see the green bar of, you know, somebody's blood sugar kind of at night. And you can see that it starts kind of curving down. So by 6 a.m., this person's waking up with a blood sugar that's around 100. And on the bottom below it, the little blue bars, you can see that it's, as the blue bars get higher, it means it's giving more insulin. And then as it kind of comes down, it means it's giving less. Point here being that, you know, you can go to bed with one of these systems. It'll figure out how much insulin you need so you can wake up with a good number. I sleep better, less lows at night, hardly any lows at night, so I'm not waking up drinking apple juice, etc. So these have all been major advances that have happened. This particular system just came out about a year ago. Um, so this is my sophisticated chart of what's happened to my diabetes regimen, and you don't have to take my word for it because it says sophisticated chart right there, and that's, that's sophisticated. So it changes to my diabetes regimen over time, 1994 to 2020, and it's really, it's gone like this very sophisticated, that there really wasn't much going on in the early years. And now literally, I mentioned new insulins that have come out, new pump systems, new continuous glucose monitors. You have to kind of stay up with this and maybe even educate your provider on what's going on because it's almost like you need a tune-up now every six months to keep up with all this good stuff that's happening. All right, so listen up. This is how I'm going to finish this talk. If you fell asleep or you're just kind of making brownies in the kitchen, whatever, just stop for a second and listen to this because the bottom line here is that living or people with type 1 diabetes are living longer now than people without diabetes. And I don't know about you, but when I was diagnosed with type 1, which is kind of messed up that they tell you this, they would say you just lost 15, 20 years of your life just off the top. Just being diagnosed with diabetes, you're going to die, you're going to live a shorter life, which is, it's crazy to hear that. And we now have data that if you control your blood sugars within a reasonable range, at least less than 8% or so, that those people tend to live longer than people without type 1 diabetes. Why? It's probably because we're a little bit more in tune with our health, seeing doctors more regularly, taking, you know, staying on top of our blood pressure and our cholesterol, and certainly our blood sugars, but that all makes a difference. The point is the hard work pays off. You're not trying just you know, to, to control your blood sugars just so you live 15 years long, you know, less. You're controlling your blood sugars, you're doing all this work so you can live a long and healthy life, period. Not just for yourself, it's a gift to you, it's a gift to your family. And this is just a chart taken from this publication that I'm not gonna go over, but it basically shows it. That this dotted line is, is basically, you know, where the normal population is. And the black line is the people with type one diabetes based on their A1C, going from six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And as someone's A1C comes down to around eight or less or so, people tend to be doing better than the general population. That's the point. Um, you still have to be very aggressive with your blood sugar control to avoid all those complications. But when it comes to just simply how long people are living, you can live a long and healthy life. And that is the point. So I like this talk. I really enjoyed kind of putting this together because what's the message? Learn as much as you can from today, from the conference, from all the educational videos, content we have online. Um, take some of this stuff back to your, your provider. I heard about X, Y, and Z. I want to start a new pump, new continuous glucose, whatever. This stuff matters. And if you keep up the hard work, you will live a long and healthy life. So again, like I said, I've learned a lot of perspective from doing this talk. We've come a long way and things are changing almost on a daily basis now. It really is the best time to have type 1 diabetes right now. Full stop. So my perspective here, is it four, is it three of these block things? I don't know, but hopefully you've gained some perspective, keeping in mind where we've come and that you know, empowers you in some way. And again, not that when your, your blood sugar is high or low and you're, you're throwing your meter across the, the room, you're not like, well, at least I have insulin, but it, it can help you know, to at least realize that we do have it pretty good and things are getting better. So that's it. Hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks for listening. So long.